the nervous system is run in vertebrates by the brain. And the vertebrate brain, especially the mammalian brain, and especially the primate brain and the human brain, uh, is very complex and has specialized areas for diverse functions. And those structures begin to arise during embryonic development. And we are better now than we ever have been at figuring out what these structures do because we have better imaging techniques. Our dorsal hollow nerve cord uh, eventually develops into several different parts of your central nervous system. And it initially looks something like this when you're a pretty early embryo. You have a forebrain and a midbrain and a hindbrain. That forebrain is going to be what eventually develops into your cerebrum, which is the biggest part of your brain. So it's this right here, this yellow part. Uh, and your deencephalon, uh, which is what we sort of call your reptile brain sometimes. It includes your thalamus, your hypothalamus, uh, which regulate your, um, your homeostatic mechanisms and your endocrine system, uh, and your epithalamus, which uh, regulates day-night cycles. And your midbrain, uh, which is still a relatively small part of your brain, and your hindbrain becomes essentially your brain stem, your medulla oblongata and your pods, which, which do the, the very basic functions of life, like regulating breathing and heart rate and things like that. And once embryonic and fetal development is over and you are born and you're a growing child, your brain looks more or less like it's going to when you're an adult, uh, more or less at least. Um, and your cerebrum is, again, this largest part. Uh, it's what we think of when we think about a brain, and it's what does the thinking, primarily. Our complex thought, um, our social behavior, our planning uh, and imagination, all of that happens in your cerebrum, our motor commands, where we tell our you know, leg to kick, one, two, three, kick. Uh, that's all in your cerebrum, which has two hemispheres. Uh, your deencephalon, again, is right up here. This is your uh, thalamus and your hypothalamus. Thalamus is kind of a relay station that routes signals coming from up and down your spinal cord to the different parts of your cerebral cortex. Uh, and your hypothalamus regulates your endocrine system uh, and via that um, is in charge of a lot of your uh, maintenance of homeostasis. And then here's your brain stem with your midbrain and then pons and medulla oblongata, which again are very important for some of the most basic functions of life like breathing. And so if you think of brain in terms of evolution, this stuff evolved first, your brain stem, uh, and then things like the encephalon, uh, and then things like your cerebrum. If we look at an adult brain and look at it from the rear instead of the side, you can see that this is your cerebrum. You can see that it's separated into a left and a right hemisphere. Uh, and you also can see that behind it is a cerebellum. And your cerebellum is really, really important not for controlling your your motor action, so not for telling your body to run or to jump or to stop or to dance, but coordinating that movement uh, with each other movement and also coordinating it with the feedback that you're getting from your surroundings, visual and auditory and tactile and, and smoothing out your motions. Uh, so very, very important for you to be able to effectively move. Your cerebral cortex is where the gray matter is. So we looked earlier at the difference in the cross-section between gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside. The gray matter is where the, the neuron cell bodies are, and that's where the synapses are. And that's me that means that's where the integration of information occurs and decisions are made. So um, the computing, uh, as you were, happens in the cerebral cortex. And you have a lot of cerebral cortex. It's one of the reasons it has so many folds is the, so that you can fit more cerebral cortex onto this size brain. And within the white matter, a lot of the white matter is just communicating between different parts of the same hemisphere. But the corpus callosum is a band of white matter that communicates between the left and right hemispheres. That's really, really important if you want your two hemispheres to be able to talk to one another. And then your basal nuclei are essentially bits of gray matter that are inside the brain. So instead of around the cortex, you also have other gray matter that's deep inside the brain, and those are your basal nuclei. Your cerebrum, again, is where cognition and memory and consciousness occur, you know, awareness, language, things like that, and it's separated into four main lobes that we'll look at. Each of them have particular functions. Your frontal lobe is sort of your command center. It 
includes your motor cortex where you send out motor controls like, you know, curl or raise roof. Um, then your prefrontal cortex is the part of the cortex of your frontal lobe that's in the very front. And this is decision making, planning. This is where we can play out how our actions may affect uh, us or others or the world and we have some level of inhibition. Um, this is often affected by drugs. If you are a teenager or even into your early 20s, your prefrontal cortex is not finished yet. It's not until you're like your mid-20s when this is finished and that's one of the reasons why I made a lot of, we'll call them questionable decisions, right up until my mid-20s maybe beyond. Um, parietal lobe is right behind that. That's where your sensory cortex is. So a lot of your sensory information that comes in, especially touch, is is integrated. Um, auditory information comes in via your temporal lobe. Um, and then in your occipital lobe, which is in the back, visual information comes in. And um, this is why you know, sometimes you may have seen people that fall and like crack the back of your head. Um, you can lose um, your vision. Even if your eyeballs are fine, you can lose your image if you crack the back of your head because you lose the ability to process that information that's, that's coming in. And then your cerebellum is not part of your cerebrum. It's a different part of your brain, but it's back here in the back. Um, on this temporal lobe, you have Wernicke's area. Um, this has to do with um, comprehending language. Uh, so understanding patterns of words, forming patterns of words that you want to say. Um, up here on this part of your frontal lobe is Broca's area. And this also has to do with, with speech, but speech rather than language. So this is actually like controlling the muscles that make your mouth and tongue move to form words. So Josh 11, 16, sky, monkey face. Um, if I were to say things like that that made no sense, Broca's area would be fine, but Wernicke's area, where I'm comprehending speech, would be messed up. Um, if Wernicke area, Wernicke's area is fine, but Broca's area is messed up, I would, or I, I would have a hard time forming the words, if that makes sense. And we know these things for a couple of reasons. One, for a long time, uh, we have been looking at what happens when people damage parts of their brain. What functions do they lose? Um, but now, more so than that, we can in real time image people's brains and see what parts of your brain are you using when you do certain thing. Techniques like PET scans, when you essentially take glucose uh, with radioactive uh, uh, molecules and, and the places where you use the glucose uh, light up when you, when you do the imaging, or now functional MRIs are even easier, you can see which parts of the brain are in action when you hear words versus see words versus speak words, or uh, when you uh, perform different actions. While your cerebrum has two uh, hemispheres and both uh, do some of the same things, just, just paired, and, and your left hemisphere controls generally your right side and your right hemisphere controls generally your left side, there are some things um, that are uh, specific to one side or the other. And generally, the left, left hemisphere tends to be more adept at math and logic and language, processing serial sequences, phone numbers, things like that. The right hemisphere is better at uh, leaps of, uh, of imagination, uh, nonverbal thinking, emotional processing, recognizing patterns. And we often think of people who are right-brained as being very artistic and people who are left-brained as being very logical or good at math. And there's some truth to that. Um, there's a great uh, book and also TED Talk that the author did by a neurobiologist who had a stroke. And she could tell what was going on kind of during the stroke. It was in her left brain. And as it would begin, she would begin to lose function. She was trying to type in a phone number for her colleague because that was the only person she could think to call. And it took her forever to, to do it. But, uh, you know, when her left hemisphere would kind of go out in terms of function, she couldn't get those seven phone numbers uh, in a row uh, into, the, uh, into the telephone. These differences in function are called lateralization. And uh, these can be linked to handedness, depending on kind of what your dominant hemisphere is.
and your hemispheres work together uh, by communicating via the corpus callosum, which again is that, that stretch of white matter, those wires that run from left to right. You process information about your brain that comes in from all over your body. You know, touch information from your fingertips and your toes, pressure and pain information, temperature information from the outside, also the inside of your body, position of your muscles and limbs, um, and visual information, and auditory information, and all of that stuff has to go to your brain, and it tends to go via your thalamus, which is a routing station. Uh, I don't know if anybody used to watch the Andy Griffith show, but it was, I think Sarah was the, uh, the old operator, and she would like unplug you and, ah, I want to talk to Barney, right? You know, plug you into the person you want to talk to. The thalamus uh, routes the information to the appropriate part of the cerebral cortex uh, that is going to process that particular type of information. All these adjacent areas that uh, compute different input uh, are going to communicate with one another, but they're also going to send information on to the uh, prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your uh, cerebral cortex that is uh, in charge of executive function. It, again, does the, the planning and the, makes the, the big decisions. Um, and so this is the place that has to receive all kinds of different information from your brain and your body. In general, on your motor cortex and sensory cortex, which are in charge of sending commands to muscles and getting sort of touch information from most of your body, um, you don't have the same number of receptors or the same number of motor units all across your body. For instance, uh, your face and your lips and your tongue uh, are much larger in this model. This is called a homunculus than, for instance, your legs are. Because even though your legs are big, for their size, they have relatively few amount of sensory receptors. Uh, and relatively few amount of, of motor units, neurons that are going to be in charge of those muscles. Whereas your fingers, you have to be able to do you know, complicated things, and so you have lots of motor units. How do we know that that frontal lobe and that prefrontal cortex are involved in executive functions and planning ahead and inhibitions and things like that? Well, we know initially from someone named Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker who was Stamp, tamping down dynamite to blow up a hill to run a railroad through, and his uh, dynamite tamp blew up and went right through the front of his skull here. And he lived, but it blew out his frontal lobe, and apparently he turned into kind of a jerk afterwards. Your brain is considered plastic, meaning you can mold it and change it even after birth in the sense that you can reinforce certain uh, uh, synapses and create new ones even, or get rid of old ones by not using them. This is essentially through practice. Again, we call this neuroplasticity. And this also has to do with use or disuse. You're going to strengthen, make these synapses more likely to uh, fire or less likely to fire, right, uh, by creating more branches or fewer. And sometimes we can uh, associate one synaptic pathway with another. Right, uh, and these are strategies for learning. Uh, very often, you can uh, associate something new that you're learning with something old that you already know, and it makes it easier for you to learn. Uh, that is using an old synaptic pathway to reinforce something new. So you can learn new things. Uh, don't ever say that you just aren't good at math, for instance, or science, because you can become better. One great example of Neuroplasticity is memory. We're constantly forming new memories. And short-term memories, like, hey, what's that phone number? I type it in, then it's gone, are formed uh, and accessed by the hippocampus. Long-term memories uh, are formed by the hippocampus, but then they are written, essentially, in the cerebral cortex. And there's a lot of evidence that we require sleep to help form and, and solidify those memories, consolidate them, which is why Sleep is important when you're trying to learn new things. One form of learning is long-term potentiation. And this is where we reinforce synapses and make them more likely to fire. So if you start like this with a certain number of neurotransmitters, a certain number of receptors, if you use this over and over and over again, you're going to add more receptors, you're going to release more neurotransmitters, you're going to make this more likely to fire um, the second neuron if this first neuron fires. So if this stimulus occurs, the second thing is more likely to happen.